Christ is risen. And he is risen. Well, this afternoon we have the pleasure of uh, Father Michael Hill speaking with us about um, our first choir director here at St. Mary's. Father Michael comes to us from St. Tikhon's Monastery and Seminary, where he's the managing editor of St. Tikhon's Press. And he's brought just a few samples of the, some of the things they're publishing at the moment at the back, and uh, those are available um, for you. And of course, uh, it's important to mention that the St. Alexis Toth Lecture is sponsored by the Boris Hansen Committee, and the Boris Hansen Committee is that committee at the cathedral that manages the trust fund that was left to the parish by um, the Boris Hansons for post-secondary and continuing education. And as part of that, for many, many years, it also uh, um, supported, underwritten, and um, hosted, actually, um, educational talks. Originally in October, now moved to May, and, in the, and now in the name of St. Alexis Toth, who was such an important figure in our own parish history and in the history of orthodoxy in America. Father Michael comes from Ohio. He, like Mr. Bennett, has five children, although only four of them are daughters, and they live at the seminary, and um, he's a delightful person, and a musician himself. So, uh, thank you, Father Michael. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for Father Andrew. Um, I've spent the last, I don't know, two, three years spending uh, a lot of times digging through your parish's early history. Um, and I'm really excited today to be able to share with you uh, a little bit of my research and a little bit of what I have found about your history. So it's, it's definitely an honor uh, for me to be with you uh, today and to be able to share. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about music in the mission of the Orthodox Church in the early years of her presence here in the United States. So we're talking specifically about the years 1880s uh, to about the 1920s. This period is so rich in history, it's difficult to know where to begin and certainly where to stop. Uh, the Orthodox Church, um, even in its musical tradition, just presents so many degrees of possibility. So in order for this talk not to last a couple of days, I had to narrow down um, and talk about something very specific uh, which is the introduction of Orthodox music to non-Orthodox audiences. Um, in other words, I will be looking at the musical interactions of Orthodox and non-Orthodox um, in a variety of ways. So public concerts uh, as one, Orthodox choirs singing services, actual services in non-Orthodox churches, and then of course non-Orthodox attending Orthodox service. So all of this asks the question of how these events fit into the larger mission. I'm thinking mission as in the term of kind of a, a mission mindset, or if you think about missionaries, um, how do these events fit into the larger mission of the Orthodox Church in America during this period? Again, roughly 1880 to about the 1920s. Um, so before I even begin, from the outside, I want to clarify that the Orthodox Church never used music intentionally to win converts. Uh, among the church's leadership, uh, there was simply an awareness that Americans loved Orthodox music, Orthodox worship, and that this power of music presented a great opportunity. They saw that music could serve as a perfect bridge between East and West, and that choirs and musicians were ideal ambassadors for introducing Americans to the Orthodox Church. So before I begin with specific examples, I would like to provide a quick overview, just to remind some of you, um, of the Orthodox Church in America during this time, uh, during her e early years, uh, specifically in the lower 48, so in the, you know, what we think of as America, not counting a lot the Alaskan mission. Uh, then we'll move um, and look at general examples of music in the Orthodox Church during this period, and then finally, uh, we'll get to our actual topic. Uh, we'll look specifically at the music tradition here at St. Mary's, and more specifically, um, the life and work of Paul Zdechenko, 
uh, the first choir director here. Um, I will, in my introduction, um, try to abbreviate, try to be as brief as possible, uh, with the hope that at the end uh, we can have a little bit more discussion, a little bit more conversation, and I can elaborate on things that I mentioned um, in passing uh, during my presentation. So the Orthodox Church, as many of you know, first came to North America, the, the continent, um, in 1794 with the Vala Mission. St. Herman and those with him uh, came to Alaska in 1794. Um, but for about 100 years, uh, this mission had virtually no impact on what we think of as the lower 48. As of 1880, there were virtually no Orthodox churches present in the lower 48. So this began to radically change in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, largely because roughly 225,000 Carpathorusans, so these are immigrants from what we think of as Southern Poland, modern day uh, Western Ukraine, um, Eastern Hungary. Uh, these Carpathorusans um, came to work in the mines of Pennsylvania, the mills here in Minneapolis. Um, and most of these, like the immigrants that came here to St. Mary's uh, were Greek Catholics. And for a wide range of reasons that we don't have time to discuss today, uh, many of these became Russian Orthodox, again, as what happened at St. Mary's. Um, so that by 1914, there was an estimated 100,000 Russian Orthodox Christians in the loader 48. So we go from let's say roughly zero to 100,000 um, in you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, a tremendous change. And these churches and more so, their choirs soon began to gain attention by the wider American community. So it's not as though Americans were completely unfamiliar with Russian Orthodox music. Um, Americans had been introduced to Russian music um, as early as the 1860s. Um, there was uh, Dmitry Agren of Solomonsky and his choir came from Russia um, at the end of the 1860s. Uh, did a tour uh, here in the United States, um, hundreds of concerts uh, throughout the United States, um, again in the late 1860s. Um, there is the um, 1888 um, example of Bishop Vladimir, who came to be bishop in San Francisco. Um, he brought with him a choir one of those choir members is Paul Zachenko, who we'll be talking about later. Um, so he brought a choir with him to the church in San Francisco. Um, and more specifically, um, probably students from the home uh, seminary, which he had been a uh, teacher and administrator at. So he brought this choir over. Um, they started singing at the cathedral and uh, immediately gained the attention of the public, specifically in San Francisco. So there's dozens of reports in the newspapers uh, talking about Midnight services at the Russian Cathedral, uh, the beauty of the of the Russian Orthodox choir that Bishop Vladimir had um, installed um, in San Francisco. In 1893, um, another Russian, Evgeny Linaf, um, a woman, um, came to the United States with a choir of 30 voices and performed at the Chicago World Fair. Um, and this was again uh, much discussed uh, about in the newspapers. However, these were sporadic and scattered instances. However, with the rapid growth of the Orthodox Church at the turn of the century, the presence of her Russian musical tradition began to be felt in a wider and more permanent basis. So several large choirs were formed in the early 1900s. Uh, I'll be showing um, a few pictures. Um, I'm, this is not... Um, I'm not using this as an outline, so I, I have a few pictures that I wanted to share with you. One of them is this lovely choir in Edwardsville, Pennsylvania. Um, Father, uh, the soon-to-be, Father Dimitri Resitar was the, the choir director, uh, so it was one of the leading choirs um, of this time period. There was also um, a choir in Passaic, New Jersey, that was also very renowned um, at the time. Uh, there's the famous St. Nicholas Cathedral Choir um, in New York City. Um, and then, of course, here um, at St. Mary's. The directors of these choirs were highly educated and competent musicians. Dimitri Resitar, right there, 
uh, was a graduate of the Cleveland Conservatory, and actually, uh, as a young man, he studied uh, counterpoint, harmony, and keyboard skills with none other than Sergei Rachmaninoff. The St. Nicholas Cathedral Choir in New York City was led by a man named Ivan Gorkukov, um, who had studied at the Moscow Sonoda School under the famous composer and teacher Alexander Kostolsky. And during Gorkukov's tenure, the Cathedral Choir performed at many major New York City venues, Harvard University, and even, uh, we'll see a picture of this here, even at the White House. Um, so here they're at the White House performing for President Wilson. So you think, uh, this is the, uh, again, uh, the St. Nicholas Choir um, at the Cathedral in New York City uh, with Gorkakov, um, the director performing, you know, at none other than the White House. So during this time, uh, dozens of reviews appeared in the newspapers of the day, and American audiences were consistently awestruck by these um, Russian Orthodox choirs. So let me offer two examples. So in 1905, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a treaty ending the war between Russia and Japan was signed, a treaty that had been negotiated uh, by the United States. In Thanksgiving for the war's end, a service was arranged for the American, Russian, and Japanese diplomats in Portsmouth's Christ Episcopal Church. So this is happening in a, an Anglican or an Episcopal Protestant church. For the event, the Russian Orthodox assembled a small choir, which included several, I hope to you, very familiar names. Um, St. Alexander Horovitsky, Father Jason Kapanazzi, Father Benedict Turkovich, the brother of, of Leonti, or Metropolitan Leonti Turkovich, and Konstantin Berkatov. At this event, after the Anglican choir um, during the service had sung even song, the Orthodox choir joined Father Horovitsky at the high altar and sang the Te Deum service. This was a very popular service. You, you find it um, in San Francisco mentioned, many other places. Um, it's essentially uh, what we think of as a service built around the great doxology. The New York Times described the offering, this is happening in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, this offering by the Orthodox as the most solemn and most impressive part of the entire event. St. Alexander Hodobisky likewise reflected soon afterwards, he's writing in the Russian Orthodox Messenger, such singing, perhaps never heard in this church, the Anglican church, and in such strong, affecting accord, must have amazed the Americans. And indeed, the Americans were typically amazed. Uh, another example. Uh, in 1913, the St. Nicholas Cathedral Choir, so this choir here, was invited to sing a concert at the National General Convention of the Episcopal Church held that year in New York City. I'll just quote a little bit from a very large review that appeared in the New York Tribune. There were but 27 voices in the choir, 21 boys and six men. But so marvelously pure was the intonation in the most trying of modern harmonies, so perfect the precision, that the organ, which had been used in a prelude, was put to shame. The singular treatment of the voice parts, no less than the extraordinary color imparted by the single contrabass singer, thinking of Glenn Miller, the low bass, uh, they had one apparently, mingled with the childish sopranos. The character of the melodies, the daring of the harmonies, the wonderful nuance and obedience in all things to the direction of the choir master, Mr. Gokokov, and by his unrestrained and unconventional gestures, suggested expression rather than time, were all new things to the audience which seemed to be in rapture by the end of the concert. The leadership of the Orthodox Church was well aware of the impact the church choirs were having on the American public and praised their efforts. None other than Father Leonid Turkovich, um, who of course was Dean of the Missionary School here from 1906 to 1912, and later he moved from here to the St. Nicholas Cathedral um, in New York City, wrote in 1916. The love of Russian church music, the growth of which we see 
of late in America and in England makes all the Orthodox so truly glad. In this appreciation and the desire to learn more of our divine services, we see a measure of kinship, even of the unity of Christian souls in which the one Christ should reign supreme. Another church leader to take note of the power of music in reaching American audiences was Father Joseph Stefanko. Uh, maybe that's not a name that's uh, familiar to you. I was surprised when I learned this, but he actually also graduated from this seminary in 1910, uh, the, the um, uh, St. Mary's uh, uh, Missionary School here. Um, he graduated in 1910 and was later assigned to Saints Peter and Paul in Passaic, New Jersey, where another uh, renowned choir director, John Borash, uh, was leading an impressive choir. There we go. So that's John Borish um, and his, his choir at a concert in 1919, um, again in Passaic, New Jersey. Father Joseph introduced a concert, of which this is a picture uh, from that, um, in 1919 in the following terms. It is our prime purpose in this concert to present Russian church music that will personify the spirit of Russian worship, to show the soul of the Russian people as it expresses itself in its devotion, knowing full well that its splendor will not only appeal to the American people, but that it will also reveal the beauty and solemnity of Russian church music. So from these general examples, we can conclude uh, three things. Orthodox choirs were impressed uh, their American audiences by the high level of their musicianship. Uh, two, uh, leaders within the Orthodox Church recognize the potential of music to act as a bridge between Orthodox and non-Orthodox and supported the work of church choirs. And then finally, Orthodox priests, choir directors, and musicians were not afraid to appear in context outside the natural sphere of their church's liturgical services. And then, Finally, as a forerunner of this general movement within the Orthodox Church was not other than St. Mary's in, here in Minneapolis. And under its direction, its first pastor, St. Alexis Tov, um, and then um, it's also its first choir director, Paul Zajenko. So first, a few words about Paul Zajenko before we return to talk about the more, uh, uh, the, the larger context of his work here um, at St. Mary's. Um, I would assume some of you, maybe all of you, um, are familiar with who Paul Zachenko is. Um, if you've read the history on your website, um, there's also um, wonderful information about him um, in the anniversary book that was published by this parish. And then he also wrote an article you might not be aware of um, about his 12 years here. So we get to hear uh, kind of firsthand his account of his first 12 years here uh, as a choir director. Uh, what might be less commonly known, and what he doesn't mention, or at least kind of passes over, um, is his life before coming here to Minneapolis, and then his life afterwards. What, what happened to Paul Zachenko when he left um, in 1903? Um, it's interesting, in a few places, um, books, articles, um, I actually came across something um, written by Father uh, Leonti Turkovich, in which he uh, also reports this, um, so there's a degree of question. Uh, but in many places, Zuchenko, um is described as having arrived in the United States as a Moscow-trained professional musician. Um, I don't feel that this is the case, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Judging from immigration documents, so the documents that um, <coughs> the manifest um, that accompanied um, his uh, voyage uh, when he came over from Bishop Vladimir, and then also subsequent uh, census reports, and then also just your own metrical records here. Um, it is likely that Polzachenko was not older than 14 or 15 when he arrived in San Francisco. So the idea that he came over as a professional musician is already a little bit um, in question. Um, likely, he came with Bishop Vladimir's choir and was just a first or second first or second year student at the Holm Seminary. Um, the Holm Seminary is uh, about 100 miles south of Warsaw, um, but it was kind of a, a Russian uh, kind of outpost for evangelizing specifically Greek Catholics in the area. 
So it's very likely uh, his uh, immigration document says that he's from Warsaw. Uh, so it's very likely that Paul Zuchenko um, was somehow associated with a home seminary and came over when he was 14 or 15 um, as a student of Bishop Vladimir with the rest of the choir. Once he arrived in San Francisco, he received his musical training in San Francisco um, at uh, the cathedral and by a certain Deacon Nicholas. Uh, Deacon Nicholas is, uh, was a choir director in Russia and he came over with Bishop Vladimir and he's reported to be uh, the singing teacher and the choir director um, in San Francisco during the period uh, from 1888 to 1891 when, um, before Zdzenko came here. According to Zdzenko's own account, he did conduct minor services in San Francisco, um, including the service at which St. Alexis Toth was received into the Orthodox Church. Uh, however, there's nothing to suggest that Zdzenko was anything more than a student during his time there in San Francisco. And in fact, there is evidence that Zdzenko continued to take voice and piano lessons after he moved here to Minneapolis. He appears as a student on several musical programs at the university between 1891 and 1894. Um, it's also, I was talking to Father Andrew about this uh, uh, briefly before, um, it's also amusing that St. Alexis, in, in one of the very few mentions that he makes of Sochenko, um, describes him to his bishop um, as being a quote-unquote ripe boy. So he's talking uh, about uh, Father Sebastian Dubovich and Zuchenko, who apparently are just, they're loved by this parish here. Um, and St. Alexis feels a little bit um, you know, put aside by this right boy, Zuchenko. All of that to say, uh, we can safely assume that Zuchenko came to Minneapolis not as a mature musician, but as a young man with only an elementary musical education. So it was actually here in Minneapolis that Sochenko matured as a musician and as a man. So I'm guessing most of you will not know that Paul Sochenko actually married a daughter of this parish. In 1898, so he was some, something between 26 and 28 at the time, he married Susan Sivanich, who was the oldest daughter of Theodore and Pearl Sivanich. Um, who were one of the founding members um, of this parish. Uh, Theodore had, had come um, in 1877. He was one of the first Carpathian recent immigrants to this area. So this was his oldest daughter, Susan. Uh, she was only 16 at the time. Um, but their names and more, more uh, specifically their ages appear in uh, your parish uh, records, the, the metrical books that I was so excited that Father Andrew showed me uh, last time I was here. Uh, Paul and Susan had two sons. Uh, they were both born here, um, Alexander and Nicholas. Um, Alexander, there's less known about him. Um, he ended up working as a screenwriter in New York City. Um, so there's a mention of him working for Radio City uh, Pictures as a screenwriter. Uh, Nicholas, the younger son, um, is, uh, there's an awful lot known about him because he had a very storied musical career. Um, he was an acclaimed baritone, not surprising considering his dad. Um, and he was most well known for singing the title role in a musical called Blossom Time. Uh, this was a musical about um, a fictional episode in the life of uh, the composer Franz Schubert uh, called Blossom Time. And he sang the role of Franz Schubert. So there's all of these pictures of um, Nicholas Zuchenko, um, you know, uh, in, the, um, in the costume of Franz Schubert in, in Blossom Time. And then um, after he retired um, as a baritone soloist, um, he went on uh, to serve as a decades-long um, director of the Chicago Lyric Opera. So very, a very storied career. <coughs> Going back to when they were still boys, um, in 1903, Paul, Susan, and their two sons um, left St. Mary's in 1903. There's nothing really to indicate that there was any problems here. Uh, very likely they left uh, for Russia. Uh, there's not absolute concrete, concrete proof uh, that they did go to Russia, but um, later on uh, there's a lot of description both in Suchenko's words and then also other reports that he did indeed go back uh, to Russia for four years, uh, probably to Moscow, where he finished his musical education. They returned, the Sashenkos returned uh, to the United States in 1907. 
Um, instead of coming back here, uh, Paul Zachenko served as the choir director at Three Saints in Ansonia, Connecticut. It just happens to be an hour and a half, two hours from, from where I live. I've sung there many times. Um, so Paul Zachenko served as a choir director in Ansonia for about two years. So there's actually a picture of him. Oh, I forgot to show you that one. So this is, sorry, I messed up. Um, so this is Paul Zachenko, the red arrow. Um, this is uh, uh, Paul um, in 1889. And as the picture demonstrates, I mean, he, he does look all of 14 or 15. He does not look like a, a professor of music. Um, so here, here's the Zachenkos uh, in Ansonia. So uh, Paul, his wife Susan, uh, just on the right of him, and then there are two boys. Um, in the car, um, is uh, Metropolitan or the future Metropolitan Platon, Bishop Platon at the time, and the priest um, and in Sonia, um, Father Vladimir Alexandrov. Um, so, but here's Paul Zuchenko. That's basically the only picture that we have um, of of them as a family um, until until very late uh, late in life. Um, however, Paul only uh, stayed in Ansonia for about two years. Um, he left in 1909 and briefly moved to Detroit. He was only there for about two months and finally settled in Chicago um, roughly around uh, February, March of 1910. Uh, Pulse served as the choir director at Holy Trinity in Chicago from 1910 to 1912. Uh, this is Holy Trinity, um, the, the famous church designed by Bill Sullivan, um, so famous you know, historical church. Uh, he served there until 1912. Um, however, very similar to what was going on in Ansonia, and, and very likely the reason why uh, Paul Zachenko left, um, the parish, Holy Trinity, was in a complete state of uproar. Um, there was actually a riot, um, it's very, very well documented, um, in 1912. Um, the priest, uh, Father Vladimir, um, this, this priest here, um, Father Vladimir uh, reportedly hit one of the parishioners. Um, there was this, this huge brawl. He came out of the altar with a cross, uh, and then the, the parish um, uh, members of the parish attacked him. The police had to get involved. Um, there was a long court battle that ensued. So needless to say, um, Father Vladimir um, was reassigned he went, uh, to San Francisco, and um, Sushenko, um either resigned as choir director um, or was forcibly replaced, so uh, we don't know. Um, we do know that Paul Zuchenko at that time, 1912, uh, started a, a long career as a teacher at the Chicago Conservatory, where he taught piano for three or more decades. Um, after these bumpy couple of years, um, life seems to have settled down for the Zuchenkos. Um, there's occasionally a mention um, of a concert by one of his students, um, in 1923, uh, the Musical Courier, um, it's a Chicago-based uh, music journal, uh, describes Zuchenko as a distinguished Russian pianist and pedagogue, reporting that he had a large and enthusiastic class of piano students and was widely known as a conscientious and careful teacher. Uh, the level of his involvement with the Orthodox Church is unknown after 1912, However, um, in the 1930s, Zuchenko was very active in the Federated Russian Orthodox Clubs, uh, FROC or FROC. Um, he appeared as a judge at a choir contest held at the National FROC Convention in 1934. Uh, the following year, 1935, the FROC Convention in Cleveland, he played piano at the convention's concerts. And then in the 1940s, um, he wrote a series of articles uh, for Frock's uh, Russian Orthodox Journal on the history of Orthodox Church music in the United States. And, and it's about this time uh, that he retired from teaching at the conservatory, um, but he and his wife remained in Chicago until his death in 1961. Uh, his funeral was held um, at Holy Trinity and he's buried in the Russian section of Chicago's Oakwood Cemetery. So um, that in itself indicates that he was in good standing for the church. Um, there's just nothing really to document um, if he had any kind of active role um, in Holy Trinity or where else he was. Um, there's so much more that can be said um, on Paul Sochenko's life. Um, there's Paul Sochenko in the 1940s. Um, a lot of this uh, material comes from 
um, including this picture, um, I had the um, tremendous uh, blessing to um, get uh, in touch with uh, Polzachenko's great granddaughter, uh, Jennifer. Um, she shared me uh, shared with me um, numerous family uh, photographs. Um, was able to confirm some of my findings, um, and including this uh, beautiful picture of Polzachenko uh, sometime in the 1940s. Um, there's, we, we could go on forever talking about uh, Zachenko. There's, there's so many other episodes, especially uh, in the early 1900s. Um, but for the sake of our, our time, um, we'll come back to our main theme. Uh, that is the choir uh, at St. Mary's during the time of Paul Zachenko's leadership and how music was used as a bridge to the larger Minneapolis community. Uh, so we noted earlier that when Paul Zachenko came to Minneapolis in 1891, there was no choir. He started from scratch, beginning with eight men, which I'm sure you know this picture because it's hanging upstairs. So there's Paul Zuchenko and his, his octet. Um, we have their names. I think it's in Paul Zuchenko's, um my, my 12 years. Um, so we started with eight men, but by 1895, uh, there was a choir, a mixed choir. So these were girls up until the age of 14, um, many young men, um, and then uh, obviously the, the adult men here, um, though they don't, look, they don't look too old there, maybe the oldest is 30 or something, um, uh, conformed what we would call a mixed chorus. So by 1895, the choir numbered 30 voices. Uh, many of these came from St. Mary's School, which had just been established in 1893. This is not 1893, but this is a picture of the students, um, 1897. That's the earliest picture I could find um, of the school. So it's, and they look really, really young. Um, but this was, this was his, uh, the, the bones in which he, uh, he put together um, this 30 voice choir. Um, according to the Minneapolis Daily Times, by 1895, there were something like 40 students um, at the school. And in addition to the regular routine of the three R's, uh, the Times reported that all children attending the Russian school are given instruction in music. The Russians rank with the Germans and Scandinavians, I suppose that's really important here. Um, they, they rank with the Germans and Scandinavians in their fondness of music, and they begin to teach their children sight reading early. Um, the Times uh, continued uh, with this really funny illustration that I couldn't resist uh, including. Um, a little tot of five years was playing the organ for the others to sing by. That is, the other day when the reporter called at the school. And she was carrying the air, the, the song, with precision worthy of an older organist. So I'm imagining one of these little kids, I don't know. This is, of course, a pump organ, a harmonium, maybe. Um, so I'm wondering how she even reached the, the pumps. <laughs> Uh, Sachenko's choir of students, augmented by the adult male voices of his original octet, gave numerous performances in a variety of venues in Minneapolis. At a concert held in Century Hall, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, but it was, it was the eminent um, hall, uh, music hall um, in this area for many, many years. Um, in 1895, the choir gave a concert in Century Hall uh, with a selection of Russian folk songs and some new pieces by Paul Sachenko. In a review the next day, the Daily Times gave the following effusive report. The second Russian concert given by Paul Petrovich Zachenko at Century Hall last evening was listened to by an appreciative audience and was even more successful than the first recital that, that he gave some time ago. Zachenko is in many ways a revelation of as a master of harmony and the spiritual quality of music. His work oftentimes reaches towards perfection, and he has accomplished a number of things that are worthy of recognition. His performance last evening was in keeping with his past record, and especially in his own compositions, did he invents a delightfully interpretive power. His chorus of 30 voices did themselves proud. They showed that they had been carefully trained by a master of the technique and, as well, the spirit of their work. They did credit to themselves and to their instructor, Zuchenko, and he can feel proud of the generous applause given to him, for it was sincere and hearty. 
In 1901, Sachenko led his choir in a concert held at the First Unitarian Church, in which he also played several selections on the piano, including a piece of his own, Russian Troika. So Russian Troika is the only piece uh, that I, I mentioned earlier that um, I had uh, communicated with his uh, great-granddaughter, and so she had um, this piece that he wrote uh, for a solo piano, Russian Troika. Um, it's the only piece that I've been able to uncover uh, that's you know an actual score of music. Even though there's many mentions, uh, there's a, a, a suite that he wrote, First Thoughts, um, but it wasn't published, and so as far as I know, it's it's been lost. Uh, but thankfully, Russian Troika still exists. Um, one of the books that I have on the table back there is a study of this individual piece, and the score for it is printed in the back, in case you're curious. Um, I thought I'd play you just a short little excerpt. Oh, there we go. Hopefully this plays. This is a media version. Zombie. So, just a short example of his playing. He goes wild here. So, if nothing else, that demonstrates that as a composer, he, he definitely has some chops if he's going to play his own music. I can. Um, so, this was Russian Troika. Um, Sachenko's appearance, so he gave this, he played Russian Troika on several uh, occasions, it's mentioned, um, but this particular uh, event was held at a Unitarian church, which you might think is a little bit unusual. Um, however, um, this in, was very much in keeping with Sachenko's uh, you know, missionary activities. Um, his choir also gave many concerts at the university and at St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Uh, for example, in January 1895, Sachenko took part in a musical and literary evening at St. Mark's Parish House, uh, during which he sang a Russian song, and it says that he dressed in a quote-unquote native costume. <laughs> following uh, the following December, Sachenko's entire choir took part in a musical service um, held at St. Mark's Episcopal Church, at which both uh, the Orthodox Choir and the Anglican Choir uh, took part they were kind of went back and forth. If we recall the other examples that I mentioned um, about the Episcopal Church um, and its interest in the Orthodox Church, we'll see that St. Mary's, and especially under Sachenko's direction, uh, was also a forerunner in this area as well. Aside from their regular concert appearances, Sachenko's choir sang at the weekly divine liturgies at St. Mary's. Um, hmm. So a notable example of their participation in the Divine Liturgy um, has to be St. Tikhon's, Bishop Tikhon at the time, but you know, St. Tikhon's visit here in 1901. On June 10th, Bishop Tikhon <coughs> celebrated the, the hierarchical Divine Liturgy here at St. Mary's. The Minneapolis journal described the event as an impressive ceremony and added that there were, quote, many visitors from other denominations. The journal also observed that a feature at the service which attracted the attention was the chorus singing of the old Russian music under the charge of Paul Zajenko. The church's leadership was mindful, thankful, let's say, of Zajenko's contributions to the mission. Uh, during the same weekend, uh, Bishop Tikhon presented Paul Zuchenko with a medal from Tsar Nicholas II. On the same year, in 1901, Paul Zuchenko was featured in the annual calendar of the Russian Church Mutual Aid Society, uh, the Rokos calendar. Um, in an ex uh, excerpt from a much larger article, um, it says, Paul Petrovich Zuchenko has been working for many years to introduce Russian Americans to national and classical music, and learning to play the piano 
for American young people, which is a significant success that not many foreigners in America have shared. So we said at the beginning that there was nothing specifically intentional about Russian Orthodox presenting their musical tradition to non-Orthodox audiences. Well, this has to be qualified because Suchenko himself told the Minneapolis Daily Times in 1895, the Russian church is just beginning to get a foothold in America. We are gradually winning back to the Orthodox Catholic Church many communicants that the Russian, the, many communicants that the Roman Catholics have numbered among their church members. Four years ago, there was scarcely a Russian church in the United States. Now our church numbers 10,000 persons and has many churches. So certainly in Suchenko's case, music played a large part in the mission and subsequent growth of the Russian Orthodox Church in America. So last night, um, I was in New York City preparing to come here um, and I actually attended a concert of Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil, uh, those being uh, put on by uh, the Clarion uh, Society. Uh, I have many friends um, in this choir, so I went to go see them. It was being held at Carnegie Hall. And I couldn't help but think uh, during, during the concert, it was a lovely performance, lovely singers, uh, but the Clarion Society is a secular institution and a majority, um, all but one of their singers is not Orthodox. And I thought, what a pity that this isn't, that this you know, lovely space is not being filled by the voices of Russian Orthodox Christians, that places like Carnegie Hall are not booking Russian Orthodox choirs, because that was certainly the case, as we have shown here um, before. Um, and if you think about the tremendous impact that would have if Carnegie Hall was putting on Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil by an Orthodox choir, just how much more we could offer um, in the sense of like actually believing the words that we're singing, um, actually being able to present it um, in a way um, that is uh, uh, you know, rooted in its natural, natural context. Um, maybe we can talk about that uh, more afterwards in our discussion uh, about how that could be regained. Um, however, uh, I'd like to wrap up and I'd like to wrap up by uh, reminding um, us of those wonderful and powerful words uh, by Father uh, Leonti Turkovich. Um, maybe one day we might be able to echo you know, what he says. The love of Russian church music, the growth of which we see of late in America and in England, makes all Orthodox so truly glad. In this appreciation and the desire to learn more of our divine services, we see a measure of kinship even of the unity of Christian souls in which the one Christ should reign supreme. Thank you. Um, so that was a, a lot of material. I, I don't like reading. I, I never read my sermons, so forgive me. Um, there's a lot of material, uh, probably too much. Um, so I, I would love to be able to open uh, the floor now uh, for questions, discussions, comments, um, how to tackle. You know, it's, it's difficult as a historian um, presenting material like this because it's, it's very much, oh, the good old days. And then obviously the question is, well, now, now what? You know, what does that mean for us today? Uh, what can we possibly do with that information? You know, is this simply just an exercise of nostalgia? Um, or is it something that uh, we can actually use, you know, in our daily life in a parish. I, when I was here before, uh, one of the things I asked Father Andrew, I was very interested about is, I, I know your early history, um, you know, I, I've um, you know, followed on the career of your choir through the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, uh, but I, I wanted to know, you know, what, what are your needs now? You know, what, what do your people uh, need to hear? So, anyways, um, I would love to hear from you um, if you have any thoughts of specifically taking this information and you know asking questions for for today you know at the present. I yes. actually have a question about the past, but other than holds any enlightenment for today. Now you talked about this riot in the church. 
Uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with the music or not, but my question is, since most of the Russian Orthodox were actually Carpathian Rusins, when priests, bishops, play directors came over from Russia, you know, Muscovite Russia or Petersburg, was there resentment or pushback or tension? You know, we never did this in Kovosha or what's now so, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did they just accept, oh, this is great music or, uh, you know, I mean, were people resentful or say, hey, this Russian guy comes in here and he's telling us to do it this way? I just curious. Uh, yes, so the reason why I became first interested in the musical history of this parish was specifically for that reason. Um, as a part of my job, I have a lot of manuscripts that come across my desk, and one of them was on St. Alexis Toll, uh, in which, in the course of this manuscript, he talks about Zichenko, um eradicating um, or suppressing uh, the Kapadlerusin chant that was practiced here at St. Mary's prior to their conversion to Russian Orthodoxy. So that's, that was my introduction to, um, to this, I guess, this history, this story. Um, there, there's certainly some evidence to suggest that there was a certain amount of russification that occurred. Um, however, um, to, I guess, present it more in a positive light, I certainly have found uh, a great deal more evidence uh, to suggest that uh, Karpatharusans were ecstatic about taking on a Russian identity. Um, it's one of the things I discuss um, in my, my book, uh, America's Russian Craze. Um, it just happened to be that when St. Alexis Tov and St. Mary's was coming into the Russian Orthodox Church, there was this huge nationwide um, Russian fad or Russian craze. Um, the, the newspapers actually call it a craze. Um, everyone wanted to dress Russian, they wanted to eat Russian, they wanted to listen to Russian music. Um, and certainly for the Kapadlerusans who were uh, suppressed minorities, um, they were basically people without an identity, um, becoming Russians was something that, um, that was uh, um, o over, over and large something positive. Um, so that is not to say that all Kapatharusans felt that way, because obviously you have St. John's down the street uh, with, with members of the congregation here at St. Mary's that chose not to take on this Russian identity. But uh, a large majority of St. Mary's Parish did take on this Russian identity, which included its musical traditions. Um, that meant that there were uh, local traditions among the Kapatharusan community that was um, either suppressed or lost, um, the Kapatharusan plain chant being one of them. Um, but I, I haven't, I have yet to come across um, any substantial evidence to suggest that this was something that was imposed on them. Um, in, in almost every case, it's something that the Kapatharusans are excited about during this particular time period within the context of this larger nationwide Russian craze. So I, Getting back to your um, question about the riot, um, I, I, I can say that that was not primarily um, a, um, you know, a, a conflict over a, a Rusin versus a Russian identity. Um, it was largely over the ownership of the parish. Um, one of the things that uh, the priest had done was to um, basically like have a, a silent ballot that removed all of the current parish council. He elected on a secret ballot another parish council, which immediately deeded over the property to Bishop Platon. So that, that, that's putting in simplistic terms. There were obviously a lot of things. Uh, Father uh, Alexandrov also had problems in Ansonia, so it might have just been a personal issue as well. Um, but that certainly wasn't the prime, you know, motivating factor. Uh, it was more church ownership and also just the personality of the priest. And we're talking about congregations that are in the thousands. Um, so you can imagine, you know, a congregation of a thousand people, you're going to have uh, m more than more than a few uh, rotten apples. So.
Sorry, Zach. Yeah. Um, you, you, had, you closed with a quote about the, the music bringing joy, you know, and, uh, and, you talk to, and you were just saying about looking to the present, like how can, how can Orthodox liturgical music be presented? And I, I was wondering if you could just speak to, well, okay, we have Carnegie Hall, we have this particular, you know, whatever choir singing. What does the presentation of Orthodox music right now look like? Like, and what do you think it could look like? What do you think parishes, St. Mary's can do, right, to kind of put our music forward? So I think, I think the first step is just simply getting over the fear of presenting ourselves in context outside of our natural habitat, so to speak. You know, it, it's still very much the practice for, you know, established larger choirs like you have at St. Mary's to have a choir concert in your church. Uh, one of the things that I found most exciting about my research is the number of instances in which Orthodox choirs actively went outside of those kind of safe zones um, and you did concerts at Episcopal churches, did concerts at Lutheran churches. You know, if they had musicians, you know, they were singing, you know, uh, you know, solo concert at a Baptist church, um, and then also public venues, um, the county fair, uh, the world, you know, the world uh, fair in Chicago. Um, so I think the first step, regardless of the size and capability of our parish, maybe we're not at the level that can be asked to uh, be, uh, you know, get an invitation from Carnegie Hall. Um, but I think that we can uh, look for those opportunities that might be outside of our comfort zones, um, but that can, um, you know, present music in a more of a neutral environment. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Is Capella Romana, are they, uh, it's our Orthodox, is Capella Romana, or are they? Yes, so Capella Romana is, is an Orthodox, organization. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're singers. It depends on what project they're working on. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of their singers will be Orthodox, uh, but they certainly, I mean, Capella Romana, the St. Tikhon Choir, um, you know, are kind of exceptions um, that, that are, are Orthodox institutions that are, uh, you know, getting out of their comfort zones, performing in uh, non-Orthodox, you know, environments. Um, I think it could be a lot more. Um, and, and also, one of the things I found the most encouraging about my research was the degree in which there was a lot of give and take. So it, I, I feel like Orthodox choirs still have a, you know, a rigid mentality of like, even if they are you know, doing a concert outside of their own liturgical services, like we're only gonna do Orthodox music. Um, so it's, I, I always find it, um, so uh, joyful or just like so exciting uh, when almost every single concert that uh, Russian Orthodox choirs did um, during the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, um, they would always sing um, at the end, they would always sing America. Um, usually it would be uh, America followed by God Save the Tsar or something like that. Um, they did, you know, they would do things in English, they would do you know, non-Orthodox music. Um, so I think, you know, if we expect others to extend hospitality to us as Orthodox Christians, um, I think there also needs to be a mutual appreciation of musical traditions outside the Orthodox Church. Um, certainly, Rachmaninoff, Kostalski, um, all, all the great Russian composers, um, obviously they're taking Russian chant, but they're also using all the tools that were available to them, most of which you know, came from uh, non-Orthodox you know, non musical traditions. Certainly, yes. there there must have been um, you mentioned these choirs singing in public places, twenties, thirties, forties. Certainly, around the nineteen fifties, most of that I'm sure stopped. Um, and so now it's a question of getting it back again. And of course, we've got as a country uh, issues whether you agree or not with with Russia that right. might once again 
put a little bit of a damper on that. Right, there's not a whole um, lot of people banging down the doors right now to hear Russian music. I mean, <laughs> yeah, for, for obvious reasons. Or everyone's just rebranding themselves as, as Ukrainian. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so, so maybe just to, to answer your question um, uh, real quick. Um, so a, a little bit of the decline is simply just demographic. So if you look at, at choirs um, in the 1920s, you know, you've got a bunch of kids. Um, you've got, you know, just judging from faces, you know, the oldest, you know, in this group, perhaps other than the priest, you know, is late, late 20s, early 30s. And then, you know, as, as you go on in history, if you get into the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, almost without exception, you'll see that the age demographic of the choir changes. So you've got just aging choirs and not a whole lot of youth coming in. So, you know, that impacts the, just the, the degree in which you can really engage in a, you know, high quality, uh, you know, manner, um, you know, with, with the public, if, if your choir um, is aging, if you're not bringing in young people, um, the, the quality of your choir is is going to inevitably um, decline. So you know some of some of the reason why we're not seeing Orthodox choirs singing in Carnegie Hall is just simply we don't we, we don't have the people. So that that's you know a, a question obviously we can explore. But um, the, the short answer is yes, um, you do see a decline. Most of that is because of demographics. Yes. I just want to comment being in the choir as long as I have. In the 50s, I believe, or early 60s, we sang on Channel 5 television. Yes, in the yes. City. it is quiet and still. And prior yeah. to COVID, we sang at the Holly Dazzle Parade mm -hmm. downtown Minneapolis mm -hmm. and the Tamara Art Museum. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's other places. It'll just come to mind. Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe one of the reasons why I yes. chose this topic yeah. is because I so. St. Mary's, I feel, is still one of the exceptions because I knew that you would be receptive to this because yes. your choir still does this too. You, you, you still have a very active choir and the choir that is still active in the larger community. So, so yes, uh, I think St. Mary's is, is still, you know, to some degree, an exception to the general rule. That's um, the people who prepared the reception are waiting over there. We could get something to eat and continue discussion as you like, as you are willing. Sure. Sounds great. So, first of all, thank you, uh, Father Michael. And, and thank the Boris Hanson Committee. And Father Benjamin, why don't you bless the food for us? Oh. 